What we call scenic beauty is often born because the earth is alive. It shakes 30 seconds of every minute of every day. The outer crust on which we live has weaknesses, fractures called fault lines, that give way under pressure from the hot inner core of the planet. And the earth quakes, changing the shape of the land. This is a seismic zoning map of the United States. There is solid scientific evidence that 39 of our 50 states face the prospect of a moderate or a major earthquake. All of California is classified as high risk. All of the major cities in California are in areas of highest risk. Frankly, I think we're gonna have an earthquake. I kind of agree with the scientists that say we're gonna have a ripper one of these days. I'm from the seismological school that says that if we continue to have these little ones, it'll save us from that great big baby. They can't predict, and I'm not going to worry about it. The biggie comes, the biggie comes, and if it doesn't, it doesn't. You can't sit around waiting for the biggie to come. You know, you, life will pass you by. Maybe I, I don't know or appreciate how afraid I should be. How afraid should we be? I've lived in California all my life. I don't think I've ever felt an earthquake. Anywhere you live, there's a chance of some sort of uh, natural catastrophe taking place, whether it be fire, flood, earthquake, or something like that. Most of the injuries that happen is not from the earthquake itself, but from the panic and the reaction of the people. I was in high school. I was sitting in the cafeteria, and all of a sudden, things start shaking, you know. It sounded like a rumbling in the ground. And then uh, the building itself, a huge building, began to just move back and forth like it would fall apart. It was a little frightening, to say the least. How afraid should we be? A tall building is shaken by movement of the ground. Different floors are moving at different rates. And of course, the equipment within the floor is trying to shake back and forth. And because of its weight and stiffness, it'll move at a different rate from the building structure itself. In San Francisco, Henry Degenkolb, a leading authority on earthquakes and construction. Some earthquakes vibrate the ground quite fast. And when that happens, if chimneys fall, glass breaks, and small buildings are affected badly. If the ground motion is quite slow, the average house is not affected but a tall building is affected. Here is a high-risk area where no one lives and where large earthquakes have visited recently. This is the Carrizo Plain, some miles west of Bakersfield, California. Movement of the notorious San Andreas Fault has torn this gash through flat grasslands. Because it is a desolate place where it hardly ever rains and no humans have modified anything, the natural changes stand untouched. Once all this was flat and smooth, and now silent convincing testimony to violence that has visited is indisputable. Yet here's an apparent contradiction. This placid body of water is Lake San Andreas on the peninsula south of San Francisco. It, too, is a part of the 700-mile-long San Andreas Fault. In fact, the fault got its name from this lake. The lake, in turn, exists because of canyons and deep valleys created by earthquakes. And Lake San Andreas and adjoining Crystal Springs have become the water supply for San Francisco and the Bay Area, a reservoir system complete with man-made dams that have survived numbers of recent earthquakes with no damage at all. Nearby, six miles of homes, businesses, schools have gone up recently. The earth's been pushed and shoved and compacted 
and the natural bulges and contours altered for people's convenience. And nothing remains to warn, here lies the San Andreas Fault. Only a single telltale sign remains, these jagged cliffs where San Andreas plunges into the Pacific at Muscle Rock. From time to time, there are a few landslides here, but on the whole, residents consider this spot quiet and peaceful. No one talks about earthquakes. And they may be right. Maybe the threat of quaking has been exaggerated. Outside of Hollister, California, sitting right on top of the San Andreas Fault, is old mission San Juan Batista, built of humble adobe and brick. In all its hundreds of years, through countless earthquakes, the mission has lost only one wall, and that was easily restored. Perhaps to call attention to the fault line that runs through the hills of Berkeley and under the campus of the university would be alarmist, too. The fault has been hospitable without question. Few longtime residents here can recall anything more frightening than a gentle rumble now and then and a dish clattering. In fact, the only really convincing evidence that the fault is still actively here is a crack in the stone wall of the football stadium that grows, creeps, the geologists say, a little wider, just the slightest bit each year. Down south in the greater Los Angeles area, some of the world's most expensive real estate stretches from Beverly Hills and Century City south to Newport Beach and rides right atop the Inglewood Newport Fault. They say it's creeping, too. But its last known major shaking was back in 1933, when much of Long Beach came tumbling down. That led to improved building codes, so California has the toughest codes in the nation and 50 years of stronger construction. There's no way you could ever build any building that would withstand the worst possible earthquake. You just make sure that it isn't going to catastrophically collapse and kill everybody. Fifty years of stronger construction may soon be put to the test. Some researchers believe that the Newport Inglewood Fault and the San Andreas near Los Angeles and the San Andreas near San Francisco appear overdue for giant quakes. Quakes reminiscent of the one in 1906 in San Francisco. It would have registered 8.2 had there been a Richter scale back then. Power failed, buildings collapsed, water was cut off, and fire completed what the earthquake had started. Communications failed early, 50-some thousand telephones the day before the quake, none moments after, when they were really needed for emergencies. At Bell Laboratories in Whippany, New Jersey, John Foss puts today's communications equipment through simulated earthquakes. We're looking here uh, at this, uh, this particular test at uh, the type of response that might be experienced in a tall, multi-story building situated very close to the San Andreas Fault during the occurrence of a very strong earthquake. Today's telephone buildings and the people who operate them are preparing to deal with a major earthquake. They're taking it very seriously. New telephone buildings are among the strongest in their communities. Inside, rows of critical switching equipment are earthquake braced to floor and ceiling to survive and continue in operation. Should commercial power fail, Batteries are on standby, earthquake braced in racks, ready to supply emergency needs without a second loss. And self-contained power units, diesels and turbine generators, back up the batteries. 
Public safety agencies, fire and police and hospitals, have telephone people assigned to their emergency command centers. Dick, LA City Fire would like us to immediately test all incoming emergency trunks. We're going to set up two command posts. The one at San Dimas is going to be at Arrow High School. The full resources of the Bell system. Over a million trained people who use the same equipment and procedures are ready to come to the aid of an area in distress. The computerized inventories of Western Electric can have replacement equipment on the way to a disaster zone in minutes. We don't schedule earthquakes. When they occur, we had better be ready. There are some things we can all do. One is to keep off the telephone if you're in a disaster area, unless you need to call for emergency help. All right, doctor, I'll try and complete your call again. You said you have a broken water main. The ne house next to you is on fire. There are just so many phone circuits, and if everyone tries to call, no one gets through. So stay off the telephone unless you need help. What are you I will try to call our operators for you, sir, and get in touch with your brothers. During the last earthquake, I worked in the phone building, and I ran outside like a dummy, and things were falling. And you could possibly have something fall on you. So remember, stay where you are and look for the nearest possible shelter. And also, if you're at home, remember, there are safety measures you can take. It is very important that you know the locations of where you can reach for your wrenches, for all those things that need to shut off your gas, your electricity. For one thing, you should always have a flashlight. Uh, you should check the batteries every three months. Most people know that they should have a portable radio with batteries. But one thing they may not know is if they don't, they can use their car radio. If you're in a car or a bus, that's a good place to stay. If there is an earthquake, never, never, never use the elevators. You should always go down through the stairwells regardless of what floor you're on. Well, standing in the doorway or get underneath the table or desk or whichever is most accessible. If I'm at work and my wife is at home and the kids are at school, we ought to have a plan where when the major earthquake occurs, where are we going to meet? How are we going to communicate? What are we going to do? People have to not only take care of their own immediate needs themselves, their families, but I think people are going to have to reach out and help other members of the community. The biggest earthquake in the United States happened not in California, but in New Madrid, Missouri, in 1811. And it changed the course of the Mississippi River. Boston had a major earthquake just before the Revolutionary War. Today, the entire area from St. Louis to Memphis has potential for a major earthquake. And of course, all of California is high-risk country.